Camp was such fun for Dorcas. The leaders told Bible stories and taught the children new songs to sing and fun crafts to do. And every day, the children received a card with a Bible verse on it to learn. As Dorcas held her card one day, she had an idea. When she returned home from camp, she asked her father to make copies of all the Bible verse cards to share with her friends at school. Then she invited two of her best friends to meet her during recess. I've brought you something, Dorcas said. They're Bible verses. Let's meet during recess to practice and learn them together. The girls accepted the cards and agreed to learn the Bible verses. When they met Dorcas the next morning, the girls had a surprise for her. Instead of just two girls, 10 children had come to meet Dorcas during recess. They all wanted cards and they all agreed to memorize the Bible verses. Dorcas was amazed that so many children wanted to learn God's word. She needed more cards. Dorcas gave each child a card and invited them to come back the next day to practice the Bible verses. Every day, more children came to Dorcas during morning recess to say their Bible verse and get another card. Within two weeks, 20 children were learning Bible verses. It was a big group. When Dorcas talked about how many children were coming, her mom suggested that the children meet at their house. Dorcas invited her friends over on Wednesday and Friday evenings. All 20 friends came, and they invited more friends. They sang songs, listened to a Bible story, and did the same crafts Dorcas had learned at summer camp. And the group kept growing. Soon, too many children were coming to meet inside the house, so they began meeting outside. Six months after Dorcas started the Bible group, about 50 children and even some of their parents were coming to the Wednesday and Friday meetings, and almost a hundred of them were attending on Sabbath morning for worship. Dorcas planned a regular Sabbath school program for the children, and her mom and dad helped lead the worship one day, she found out that several people had given their hearts to Jesus and wanted to be baptized. What good news that was! Because Dorcas let God lead her, a whole new church was planted in her village in Papua New Guinea. We can do big things for God if we follow the ideas that Jesus gives us. Please pray for children like Dorcas who are helping to lead others to Jesus. Happy Sabbath. It's so good to see each and every one of you this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. I just stopped by to let you know that Jesus loves you. I don't know what kind of week you had this week, but Jesus does. I don't know all that's going on in your life, in your heart. I don't know all of your needs, but Jesus does. And I hope and pray that as we spend some time together today, 
that you will be encouraged. And even though it may seem like it's an education focus, I want you to even now begin to open up your heart and your mind and really know that it's really more than that. Is that okay? I stand here before you as a testimony of God's grace and his mercy, and I'm thankful to be able to worship with you today. Pastor Bob, I want to say thank you for extending the invitation for me to be here. I'm so grateful for you and for your lovely wife's ministry and all that you do. Thank you, and thank you for serving this field, both of you. I also um, want to give just a word of appreciation to my son, Jaron, is here, and I'm so thankful, Jaron, that um, you chose to worship here with your mom today. Um, instead of being at your church that you usually worship at. Thank you for loving me. I bring you greetings, first of all, on behalf of our great Chesapeake Conference and the team of ministry leaders and officers, be it pastors, lay ministers, teachers, Bible workers, all of those who work with us. What a privilege it is to serve us. And I want you to know that we are very grateful for your ministry and what you do here in this part of the vineyard. In case you did not know, with a budget that equals 100% that has to be balanced each year. Just think of a pie, 100% of that pie. I want you to know that almost 50% of that pie goes towards Adventist education. Amen. All of you should have said amen. amen. That means Adventist education is valued, is highly supported, and it is something that we really, really, truly believe in. I think the mandate is only about 20%. I'm not quite sure. It might be a little bit lower or higher that the recommendation is from the um, general conference. But our conference believes that education and evangelism work hand in hand for the salvation of our souls. And so we thank you for your faithful commitment. We thank you for your faithfulness with your tithe. And we thank you for your faithfulness for your stewardship that stays here as a part of this vineyard to make sure that you're growing. I want to also say thank you so much to our wonderful staff. And I see uh, many of you that are here, our principal, and thank you, our teachers, Gail, for being here, Jessica. I'm not sure if anyone else is here, but thank you. And I want to say how much I enjoy whenever I come to the school. I think that's probably one of my favorite things to do is when I leave the office and when I go around and see the boys and girls and I visit in their classrooms. And some of you are looking at me, okay, so what is she going to be talking about today? Well, believe it or not, I want to say, first of all, to the parents and guardians who are here, I want you to know that as a product myself of Adventist education, and as a little girl growing up in my home church in Detroit, Michigan, it was because the faithfulness of members like you that saw something different in me. And they may not be alive, many of them, to witness what I do today, but they invested in a little girl because they said that she belongs to the Lord. I stand here today as a testimony of a mother, a single mother at that time through divorce, who said that she would do whatever it took if it meant working two jobs, and she did. If it meant selling grapefruits and oranges out of her car, she did. Whatever it took, whatever she could help to support, she did, because she believed that the greatest investment were her children. I stand here as a testimony for those of you who may think that sometimes it's too hard or too difficult or you may feel like giving up, that it's not worth it, that I'm a witness as a parent that it does. And so I hope that that shines through as we spend some time together. Our most important reason why we're here is because of the boys and girls. Didn't they do a fantastic job this morning? Yes, they did. They did. For them to stand up. And let's clap for them. I think it's okay. We have to celebrate them. We have to celebrate them. They're not going to always be little forever. And so what we pour into them and how we celebrate them and how we help to shine upon them, those are memories that they carry with them forever and forever. And as a church, you need to be commended for providing a safe haven for our boys and girls for over 20 years. You know, there are businesses that thrive and there are businesses that shut down. And I don't care 
what we talk about in terms of the different businesses, the car industries, in terms of what is out there, in terms of social media, and we hear different things about that, the takeover of the different things that are going with that, and the billions of dollars that are being sent, spent for those things, there is no greater investment than what we give to our children. Amen. There is none. And Adventist education, I believe, is something that begins in the home, but it also is a part of Sabbath school, AY, Pathfinders, church service, when we involve our children, it's everything that we do. Well, let's get started. If you don't mind, because I want to make sure that you're with me, I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. And I'm going to ask that you would imagine that you're in a classroom because our message today is entitled The Classroom of Trust. If you have your Bible or if you have your... Um, phones or whatever. I want you just to hold them up. It's just something that I like to do as an evidence of our love, you know, and I thought about the sea of people who were shouting for those fans, those football fans and baseball fans, and they had their little banners and they had their little things and they were swinging them. And I'm like, Lord, we hold up this in the name of Jesus, because we know we win with you. If you can repeat after me, I choose to trust in God. I choose to trust that God loves me. I choose to trust that God's word is true. Yes, would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you that you have given us the power of choice. Lord, if it's in your word, help us to believe it. Help us to trust you. And as we enter into this sacred place even further today, please speak through me. And I pray that we'll all be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like for us to look at a text of scripture before we start, which is found in Acts 2, verse 6 through 8. I want to look at 6 through 8 specifically. That's what we're going to be looking at. And boys and girls, I know that you like a good story, and you're probably wondering, what in the world is Dr. Humphreys going to be talking about today? But hang in there with me. Is that okay? Acts 12, 6 through 8, helps to paint a picture of where we're going. And I'm going to read it in your hearing. 6 through 8, if they're able to. That night, before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. The angel ordered Across the nations, our schools have opened. After going through COVID for two years, some of our schools continued on in terms of having online instruction. Some of our schools had hybrid and blended. But praise God, this year we were able to enter into the hallways. We are so thankful that the teachers were working and dreaming and planning and collaborating, thinking about as school was going to open, how are we going to educate our children this year, Lord? What is it that you want us to do? They thought about their theme, be as salt. They thought about their boys and girls coming in. They envisioned that soon and very soon there would be some children who would accept Christ as their personal savior. Oh, yes, they were entering the classroom of trust, even with the ups and downs as the school year has begun. We don't hear our teachers quitting. In their minds, they're thinking, Lord, even though it's difficult sometimes and it's hard and we are exhausted many days, Lord, we're going to trust you that we are here because you've called us to be that. We're working tirelessly to make sure that our children are not just educated for here, for serving people here, but we're educating them for eternity. And the teachers, it's a classroom of trust, parents and guardians working together, hoping and praying that the administrators and teachers, support staff and school board will do everything necessary to protect and take care of their children. Teachers trusting that you will support them 
with their children. Because after all, they're with the teachers awake more than they are with their parents at home. After all, when the doors open and the parents drop them off, they go to work. It is their prayer that inside those buildings, that what happens, that the children are safe. They're hoping and praying that what the teacher said that they're going to do, that they're going to do. And the parents are hoping that when you come and pick up your children, that you'll embrace them back with love, that you'll make sure that you ask them, did you have a good day? But also say, what was good about your day? Oh, really? Something didn't happen good? What was that that happened? And then we're all working together on behalf of the children. So when we think about it, even though we have our teachers and they're well-trained and we praise God for them, God is the master teacher in the classroom of trust. And he invites you and he invites me to sit and learn from him. Each day is a new adventure. There are great days in our lives, and there are challenging days. But all is well. Let's think about it. In the classroom of trust, there are two main vocabulary words. Trust God. Let's think about that. The first word, trust, is a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, the character, or strength of someone or something. And the second word is God. Definition, capital G. He is the sovereign one, creator and ruler of the universe, the great I am. And God sees you in this classroom of trust. He sees your mom. He sees everything that's going on. He sees our little ones. And every day you wake up in the morning, it's as if he has taken attendance. And your very breath says, present, Lord, I'm here. As students are asked to enter each day into the classroom to learn, so Jesus invites you to consecrate yourself and your family each day to love and serve him. Follow me as we look at a classroom of trust. The school year has begun in this classroom that I'm going to talk about today. Use your imaginations. You've taken your seats. Today's class will be taught by the greatest teacher that ever lived, Jesus. The greatest lesson theme today that we want to learn? The story of redemption. The students with the best seats in the house, the class, we'll look at the 12 disciples, but actually, you got the best seat. Jesus chose the space and time in which he lived to serve as his classroom. Can you imagine if you were actually there can you imagine if you were actually learning from the master teacher? Think about it. They learn how to care for the sick, raise the dead. They learn how to look at a little boy's lunch that was given and saw how over 5,000 people were fed. Can you imagine being in the classroom with Jesus? Now, they wanted him to trust him. It was just 12, more than we have here today, just 12. They were in a multi-grade classroom for three and a half years. <laughs> we often talk about how, what can we learn in a multi-grade classroom? But can you imagine their different ages, their different sizes, their different backgrounds, their different ways in which they were? And Jesus took them. They could have gone to other schools to be taught, but God had a plan. The school was not as large as others, did not have what some could say all the bells and whistles that the Pharisees and the Sadducees could offer. But unbeknownst to them, that was the school that God used to change the world. And oh, how he loved them. They did not always understand his ways, but they hoped and believed he would redeem them for such a time as this. He chose to make a school of disciples who would go and make disciples, and make disciples. And even if they started off small, Jesus saw that someday these 12 men had the potential to change the world. They were mocked and ridiculed and given a hard time by religious leaders. But just like a regular classroom, even though there were many students of 12, Jesus saw each one. 
He knew their names. He knew their families. He knew what they were like. One of the things that I admire about your principal is that I was told and I've witnessed that she doesn't just see the students that come in, but she knows each of them really very individually. Now, when I am telling you this, you may say that all principals may know students' names and maybe where they're from, but our principal is blessed with the gift of compassion and empathy that truly that shines through her. And that's only through the love of Jesus. So she's able to look into their eyes and look into see that she may only have them, yes, for this period of time, but it's something inside of her planted by God and she gives God the glory for it that she's able to see and look that someday this child is going to do something special. This child, what a wonderful opportunity that the disciples had to be with Jesus. And we want to look at just one of them. His name was Peter. Peter. One day, when Peter was grown, boys and girls, even though he had preached many years for Jesus, he ended up in a prison cell. In the Bible and Acts, it talks about how he was there because people were upset. They were angry, so much so that they killed one of his friends. And the next day, the next morning, his life was going to be taken. The Bible goes on to say that Peter made a choice because the Bible says that when the angel came to him, even though he knew the next morning he was going to get a big beating or whooping boys and girls, we know he was going to be killed. Peter was fast asleep. How do you go fast asleep? I mean, snoring. How do you just lie down and go fast asleep when you know that the next morning you are going to not live? I believe that Peter learn how to do that over time. I believe that he was in the classroom of trust. I believe that Peter, who was a preacher now, and when he saw that happen, he said to himself, you can do whatever you want to do, but right now I am going to trust in the promises of God. So that's the first thing I want to look at. And if you all can change the screen to that, because I don't think I have that with me, I'll do it. No, I don't. No, yes, I do. Let me see. So there's four things. Because parents, there are going to be some things, grandparents, aunts, uncles, children, that are going to happen, that are going to shake your world. You are not going to know what to do. In the classroom of trust, it takes intentionality to think about what am I going to do in those times? And then how do I model that for my children? The first thing I want to talk about is trust in the promises of God. Remember what God has done in the past to help you cling to the promises that you need to hold on. I can imagine that Peter, before he went to sleep in the prison, he heard himself say, let not your heart be troubled. I can imagine that Peter reminded himself, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Lord, I'm asking you if it's your will that I be delivered from this. But I can imagine him saying, as he remembered, Jesus said, not my will, thy will be done. 
I can imagine that he talked to himself. I believe that he was embedded with the word of God so that he could cling to the promises of God. When Isaiah 41 10 says, fear thou not for I am with thee. God is telling you not maybe I am with you. Fear not. I am with you. No matter what you go through, no matter what the situations. And so you cling to those promises. But how do you cling to it if all you cling to is CNN news? How do you cling to it when all you cling to is what your job description has for you to do every day? How do you cling to it if you're more interested in making sure your children have the latest clothes and the latest gadgets and the latest games? How do you cling to it when you don't take the time to get to know Jesus in the classroom of trust? It won't happen. One of the reasons we have evidence education is because those who founded it said, we believe in God's word and we want our children not just to have it in our home and in the church, but we want it all the way around because it's the promises of God. And isn't it good to know that we can trust God? Isn't it good to know that you have someone that you can trust even when you are by yourselves? Parents, can you trust God when God tells you, when you don't even know how you're going to pay the tuition? And you say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful with tithe and offering. I'm going to be faithful because that's what you asked me to do. And Lord, you've asked me to put these children in the ways of the Lord. I may not understand it. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how they're going to do it. But Lord, because you promised, because you asked me to do it, I am going to be faithful to you. Peter trusted God's promises. I ask that you would allow yourself as parents to write those promises on your children's tablets. Put it on their cell phones. Put it on the refrigerator. Talk about it when you're driving in the car. Talk about it when they're going, getting ready to go to their games in the evening. Talk about the promises of God because it's the promises of God that they're going to cling to because it will have challenges. It's going to come. But if those promises are there, they can cling to it. The next thing I want to share with you is trust in the providence of God. What do I mean by that? Peter had to trust that God was in control, even if he was to die, even if I was to lose my job because they said I now have to work on Sabbath. God is in control. Even if I'm praying for someone and they don't seem to be getting better, Lord, I'm going to trust in your promises. I'm going to trust that whatever you do and say is your providence. I am in, I'm your child. I'm in your classroom. You're the master teacher. I trust that whatever you're instructing me, it's for my good. I trust that, Lord. Peter had to trust that. He had to trust that even when he didn't understand it. Remember, it was that same Peter when Jesus asked him in the same conversation, Peter, who do people say that I am? Remember, he talked to them about him. Oh, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And then soon after that, Peter was the one that said, oh, Jesus, you are not going to die. Jesus told him, I've got to die. I've got to die. And Peter was the one that turned around in this classroom of learning to trust God and say, no, it's not. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. It's not that I'm calling you Satan, but that is not my agenda. God has a different lesson plan in the classroom and trust. And the lesson plan does not always look the same for everybody. I don't know what your lesson plan is going to look like. I don't know what you have to go through. But I do know the end result is graduation, which is his kingdom. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I am so very thankful that we have a school that teaches our boys and girls that. And I'm telling you, if for whatever reason your child is not there or you're thinking that it's not good enough or not best enough, I'm, I want to encourage you to understand. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it follows um, accreditation um, principles. It follows standards. The teachers are trained. The teachers are accredited. They are lifting our children up in today's times. 
when we have so much going on in, in the world with education. Are you following it, parents? You hear about the standards, and yes, we do follow that. But do you also know that they're embedding so many other social things within the curriculum? Some of them are being disguised. Some of them are straight up. It comes out in terms of the pictures and what they see. It used to be a period of time where people fought to say that when boys and girls are opening up their books, we're not seeing children that represent our culture, and they fought for that. And just like they fought for that, which was important, do you also know there's an agenda to fight for things for your boys and girls to see that are not according to the word of God? Do you understand that they look at that stuff? They look at families that don't look like families that are supposed to represent Christian values. Do you understand that they're watching and seeing and talking about that? And sometimes people are in charge teaching them and using different things to set their agenda. We're living in difficult times. So you want to be careful that you don't just put your hands on what God is trying to do. Don't ever say that the, that the church school costs too much. Is too much of your local budget. No. How much is too much to save me? What if they had said that? How much is too much to save you? We find it. We dig harder. We dig deeper. And we realize what it's for. I witnessed this for myself. I'll give you a testimony. I was asked to be a principal. My husband was pastor at that time. And my husband is now deceased. But when he was pastor... Um, he was asked to start a church school. And we started this little church school, and um, we were so very grateful for it. And there was a lady there, and she's allowed me to give this testimony so I can say her name. Her name was Sister Poole. And Sister Poole worked for the state of Illinois. Very, very uh, intelligent woman. Very, very. I mean, she would oversee the guidance and the structure, and you talk about STEM education. She was doing that, you know, years ago. I mean, years ago. And she had a daughter. She had several daughters, but her youngest daughter, she had just gone through a divorce, so she decided, I am going to sell my house where I am, and I'm going to put my house in the best school district, public school district, so that my Vicky can go to the best schools. Just think about it. Single parent, educator, thinking wise, right? Makes sense. Local school, she's a young person, fifth or sixth grade, Put her there. And one day, the boys and girls performed in church. And Vicki said to her mom, Mom, I want to go to that church school. And the mother told me her heart could have sank. Like, what? Ma, I want to go. Now, mind you, the church school only had about 30-something kids. And we had multi-grade. And the school she was going to was one of the top in Illinois. Had everything you could imagine. And the mother said, she came to me as she sat in my office, and she said, because I was a principal teacher at that time, she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm looking around the building. You know, the building looks pretty good. And you could tell she was distraught. Like, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Y'all, you don't have really a science lab? And I, and I really believe Vicky's going to be in science, so you don't have a science lab? And, and I'm concerned because uh, I don't see all the, the tools for math. And, 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 wh and wh where's the playground? And, and where is this? And, 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 and she likes sports. And, and where is that? And I said, I, I hear you. And I let her just talk. Can we pray? Can we pray? Can we pray? Sure, we can pray. Of course, I told her some things about it, but it had to be the Holy Spirit because she came back to me and she said, Vicky's going to come to the school. But can I come too? You want to come to our classroom? Yes. I want to know if I can come and if I can make some science labs and if I can bring some STEM programs into the school and if I can help train the parents and if I can help train the teachers. Ah, me? By myself? Principal teacher? Did I turn that down? I said, oh, yes. Come on. Come on. Do what you want to do. And she did. And not only did she come that year, the following year, the following year, even after Vicki graduated, even after Vicki graduated through high school, even after Vicki graduated from college. And let me read to you. The mother knew that God had her hands on her to be involved with science. That's the beautiful part about praying about your children. She knew it. Let me tell you about Vicki. 
She became a disciple as a child. Because that's how we're here is to disciple our children, right? She discipled her mother because she told her mom she wanted to be there. She went on to Oakwood University. She earned a BS in chemistry. She went on to Purdue University in Indiana for a PhD in biochemical engineering. She then went on to Harvard Medical School for her postdoc in gerontology. She is now at Rush Medical Center as an assistant professor and researcher for Alzheimer's disease. But most of all, she is still a disciple for Jesus. She credits and she knows and she goes back to that little church school and she reminds them of what it was like for her when she was little. She says, I'm an alumni of this little school. And she loves the Lord. She realized as a child that even though she had all these scholarships, she can go anywhere she wanted to. Even when she graduated from high school, there were schools and universities calling her. But she chose to go to one of our Christian universities. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a part of the hidden curriculum that you can't get somewhere else. You cannot get the foundation of Jesus loving you and caring for you and holding on you and faith integrated. And we take it for granted sometimes, but it's not to be taken for granted as we're getting closer to the second coming of Christ. <sighs> Trust in the presence of God. What is it like when you're by yourself and alone? And you feel like no one is there. Trust in the presence of God. Peter was alone in the cell by himself. He had to learn how to trust in the presence of God. He knew that even though there might have been other things going around him and soldiers and different things, and even though there was no one that he could hear praying for him physically, he was not alone. And isn't it wonderful that we have a body of believers that sometimes when we're by ourselves and we think that we are, that we can call someone up and we can say, can you pray for me? And we know our sister or our brother is praying for us. Isn't that wonderful that we have that? Isn't it wonderful that he could know and believe? Because the Bible says that they were at home praying for him and he could trust that they were praying for him but the same thing was he had to learn when he was in that cell by himself he was not alone remember he had to remember things what was that story about he was in the boat he got out of the boat to walk on the water right did the other disciples come with him it was like he was alone but who was there Jesus was there. So when we know that no matter what the situation, what the problem, we can look at Jesus in this classroom of trust and say, Lord, I'm going to trust in your promise, your presence. Lord, could you just embrace me when I'm in tears and don't know even how my tears are going to be dried up. Lord, help me to trust and know that you're just right here with me. When my children are maybe in different places of the United States or world, Lord, I trust you that your presence is with them. I may not be able to be there physically, but Lord, you are. If I can't get into a hospital room to see a loved one, I can't spend the night with them now because of restrictions. Lord, you are with them. I trust you in your presence. And when our boys and girls come to our schools, we trust and we believe and we know that the Holy Spirit dwells there. The board has prayed for them. The pastor, you all have been praying. We're trusting in the presence of God. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And so God is with you too. He sees what you're going through. He feels your pain. He knows when our children hurt. He understands death, sorrow, pain, financial setbacks. He's nearer than the air you breathe. And I believe that God dwells at Friendship Adventist School. I believe that. Daily worships and prayer time, praying over the children. I believe it. I've seen it. You know it. The last thing I want to share with you is trust in the power of God. Peter knew what God could do. He knew what God could do. The word has power. Peter saw when Jesus spoke to the widow of Nain's son in Luke chapter 7, verse 14. Peter remembered, young man, I say to you, rise. When God speaks over life 
and death. And if he can raise the dead, he can raise whatever situation that we go through so that God is with us. Peter remembered that he denied Jesus three times and he was forgiven. He welcomed him with open arms. Peter experienced the power of Jesus. I want to just share a statistic with you a bit. And this is just important. When the home, school, and church work together, and that's why I want to affirm you today, if only one of those things, home, school, and church, so like just the home is working with the child to bring them to Christ, then there's a 37% chance that that child will continue loving the Lord. If there are two, say like there's the home and the church working together, or the home and the school, then there's a 62% chance that a child will maintain a relationship with Jesus. But if all three are working together, it goes to 99%. Continue doing what you're doing so that God's will can be glorified in what he does. The song says there's power in the name of Jesus. I told you the story. The angel came. The angel said, Peter, get up. Tapped him. You got work to do. So I say to you today, let the come. If God was to come and tap you on your shoulders in the classroom with trust, can he say to you, you're doing good, you're doing great, but come on, get up. There's still some work to do. You're still alive. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter where you work, what you have, what you don't have. God is saying to you, you're here, you're a part of this. Come on, Peter, get on up. There's work to be done. I got something that you got to do. Well, Lord, it's okay. We're doing good. It's all right. We, we, we've balanced our budget. And God says to us, you are doing okay. But listen, I want you to challenge yourself and say, imagine if the school was just full of children. Imagine if the neighbors would send their children here. Imagine if we would open up our mouths like the people on the baseball field for the World Series and said, yay, yay, yay. The children are worth it. Yay, yay, yay. Come, come. We have a place for you. Imagine if we believed in what God has asked us to do. He's telling us to arise, to get up, put up on our shoes so that we can do what God has asked us to do. And why? Because the children are worth it. Well, the school day will end someday, just like Jesus and his disciples, three and a half years. And Jesus says to us, the real deal is, one day, the last bell of Earth's history will ring. Earth's classrooms will come to an end, and Jesus will say, the classroom of Earth is now dismissed. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more worries. Enter into the joys of heaven where we can learn together with peace forever and forever. The classroom of trust, trust in his promises, trust in his providence, trust, trust in his presence, and trust in his power. I want to end with just a testimony about myself, not for any other reason than to encourage you to know that if God can work in my life, he can work in your life. I told you when I was a little girl that I wanted to go, that I was a part of church school, but I was like that little girl too. I was like Vicky. I don't even think she even knows. I was attending public school. I saw the children leading out and I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I want to go to church school. Isn't it something how God brought that back to me? I'm just realizing it now as I'm speaking to you. And my mom, like I told you, was a single parent and um, four of us, my two brothers were older and my mother was willing, along with the church family members. And I grew up in a time where Christian education and Adventist schools and the Adventist community across North American division especially was valued. We don't really value it now. We don't. There may be a few of us, but we don't. We think that the world offers better and there's more competition charter schools and people that have their other schools. But my mom, she sacrificed and put me in school. 
And I went on school, went on to academy, boarding school. And when other boys and girls came home for Christmas break, I stayed and worked in the bread factory to help my mother pay my tuition. During the summer, when other people were out playing and having a good time with their families, I was a literature evangelist because I valued Adventist education as a child. And I wanted my mom to understand I appreciated her sacrifice. Went on to college, was going to be a missionary nurse, and I worked at summer camp, fell in love with children. Thought I was still going to go from a missionary nurse to a doctor, majored at Oakwood University in medicine. And then God said, nope, I want you to work with children directly. I changed my major, and at that time I transferred to Andrews and I became an educator. And I've been in education those times. I married a wonderful man who loved the Lord, loved ministry. And we worked in ministry for 21 years, had two precious children, two boys, and suddenly one day in the classroom of trust, my husband, who had just prepared us for breakfast that Sunday morning and who had was getting ready to take the boys to Pathfinders as well as go to pick up things from the dormitory for kids who were leaving Oakwood that year. He was the chaplain at Oakwood at that time. Suddenly he died that morning. We were left with only a hope that we would get through. I can tell you that the classroom of trust is real. When you don't know if you can even breathe your next breath, when you don't even want to breathe your next breath because the pain is so deep, my hurt was for my children because they were hurting. We were a very, very close family that loved the Lord. But God reminded me, and I know it was through all those experiences, what I had to go to was the word. A person came to me a few days after my husband passed, and he said, Renee, the Lord told me that I was supposed to help counsel you through this. He said, but I'm beating myself up because I don't even know you. <laughs> and I didn't know him. He knew my husband. But God chose him because my place of healing for me since a little girl was always the word. And I went to him and I said, you got to show me in the word. You got to remind me in the word that God is able to get me through this. You got to remind me in the word. And time after time and week after week, he'd pour into me. But it wasn't anything from, and he had his degree in psychology and he was a pastor. He was a teacher, professor at Oakwood. He went to the word because that's the language that I learned as a little girl. And that's the language that I speak. I stand here, as I told you when I started, as a testimony of God's grace. He said to me, Renee, one day you're going to be standing before people and sharing your testimony. I was like, I can't even make it to the car. He said, you will. God is going to be with you. I thank God for my sons. People told me that I would lose my home. They said, you won't be able to function without your husband. They said, you're going to lose your home. She's not going to be able to work. She's not going to continue school. She's not going to be able to do. And they were probably right on my own strength. There's no way. I thank God for the village. I thank God for church school. My children were um, both there, and at one period of time, um, they were not. But I know it was the village. So what are they doing now? Jaron is here, and praise God. My first thing is, is that he loves the Lord. And um, he can remind me when things get tough. Ma, what does the word say? Ma, 
Let's talk to the Lord about it. Ma, did you pray about it? Parents, your children will pour back into you. He's working, and praise God. Um, he chose to move here in this area, even though he could have gone to other places. He said it was because of me, so I guess I must be getting older, but he loves me too. But, um, <laughs> um, and he's working at, um, in his field. He's a senior financial analyst. Praise God. He's working hard and doing well. Didn't have to go that way because he could have said, oh, no, this God thing, daddy's gone. Uh-uh. Praise God. My other son is a minister. Praise the Lord. He's a pastor in North Carolina, and he and his wife are ministering there. She's an educator, and we have a little grand, they have a little daughter, my granddaughter. I don't say that to brag on anything. He loves the Lord. They're faithful. When people look back at where God has brought me, they know it's a story. You will have a story, too, and you probably do. I want your story to be embedded in the classroom of trusting in God. Trusting in his promises, his providence, his presence, his power. I don't know why God chose certain things to happen, but I'm going to trust in his providence. I'm going to trust in his presence and trust in his power. And I pray that no matter what you go through, no matter what challenges the school goes through, that you remember that God is always with you. That in the classroom of trust, it may get difficult, but just remember who your master teacher is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Help us to trust you no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. What we never lights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey or there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go never fear only trust and go